Welcome to the Gnostic Informant. I'm Jesus, the Logos Incarnate, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And first of all, before we even do anything, I just want to thank everybody who, who so far who donated to the fundraiser. You guys are the best. I just really wanted to get that to, to say this before I even started anything. Um, so far, we got 700 plus out of the 2000 that I was asking for. And even if that's all I got, that's enough to do this. We can get some sound equipment for and well, you know, that's, that that's, I'd be grateful for that. Um, but yeah, so thank you for that. I just wanted to just thank everybody who's so far who just contributed and, um, really, really, really grateful for that. With that being said, Pat Lowinger is here from the channel Biddy Buddha. If you haven't subscribed, it's in the description. It's a channel just like mine do the same type of conversations, have people on. And, oh yeah, of course. What do you give me that face for it's might even be you got more personality. It, it, it may get a little crazier on that channel than yours. I mean, we, we yeah. th I, that's one thing. Yours is your subject matter is pretty straight on. I I definitely like well, the focus. Well, yeah, we're still yeah. finding ourselves sometimes. You, well, you're, I, I like your channel. You guys have a di a wide range of topics, social issues, history issues, religion issues, all that stuff that's important that really needs to be talked about. Is talk and you have a lot of people contributing. So there's different personalities, different. It's really a great, great channel. It's a really good idea. And I, it's the links in the description and you guys should be subscribed by now. If not do it right now, I'll come right back. Well, thanks, Neil. And I think that's kind of the strength of our channels. We got a little bit of everything, you know, yeah. um, one week I'll be interviewing witches and yeah, you know, in the next week we'll be talking I, about I've done that on this mystery channel. religions. Right. So, yeah. And like, you know, I guess by definition, I'm technically an atheist, but I don't like wear that badge around. Like that's, I'm, I'm team atheism. I'm actually literally diving into these texts with an open mind, trying to see what it's all about, trying to find the truth about these things, trying to see that there's a evolution of, of religion over time that leads to different different aspects of worship in different areas. And I'm trying to learn and not be critical, not be too critical of this, but also have a healthy amount of criticism and not be like, yeah, it's all true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I just I mean, I just finished discussing you know class finished up and i taught a class on you know ancient christian magic and it was really interesting to see students go wow we didn't understand that like a lot of these traditions that are now mainstream in christianity were lifted right out of greco-roman polytheistic ancestor worship systems and transported right into their you know magic now when you're talking about your own beliefs you don't like that word sometimes well i don't want my beliefs to be called magic but right. um you know 
from a neutral point of view, you know, the Christianity in the second through sixth century and beyond, but the period I look at was definitely a magical system. I'm just going to throw an example out there real quick and just to, just to play with some, play, play with some people's heads before we get into this. Imagine if I told you, if I told you to, to, uh, if, if you wanted to, let's say, get someone to love you or something, right? Just some forced in the, in the, in the universe to happen. Let's, let's just pick, get someone to love you. And I told you to dip your finger seven times in this blood and then sprinkle it seven times on the wall. It sounds like a magic ritual, right? Well, sure enough, you go to the book of Leviticus and it says if the, if the priest, if the Levi priest sins, if, if then the whole nation is under sin because of that. So the way to get out of it, he has to dip his finger in the blood of a bull. But first, he has to kill the bull in front of the in front of the Holy of Holies with Yahweh, with the smoke in front of it. He has to do it in front of Yahweh. And then after he kills the bull, he has to dip his finger seven. It says specifically seven times. He has to dip his finger in there and sprinkle it. That's in the Old Testament. These are this is magic. That's what like I don't know another word to describe it other than it's magic. Well, if you're trying to be nice, you call it ritual. You, you know, ritual purification, yeah. right? Right. So, but I'm just throwing an example out there. You can, if you just take the words out of Christianity or Judaism and replace it with whatever your own your own name, or replace sin offering with make someone love me or whatever you want it to do, it becomes a magic trick. But for certain things, we don't call it that. That's all I'm saying. But I, I, I think you're oh, right. No, no, I, yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, we could talk about magic all day, but yeah. we're not going to. Like, right, that's, right. That's my jam. So, so I got this, um, Apuleius. We're going to talk about ISIS, right? ISIS. Right. And if you saw the thumbnail, it says baptism, conversion, salvation through ISIS. We're going to get into why I put that up there. Um, do you want me to pull the slides up? Sure. Um, I think, you know, when you, for those that haven't read the book, I think it's a really good read for anybody interested in ancient history. Um, Apuleius, you know, just mid second century is writing this text. Um, and so we look at, he's projecting from his time period and he gives us some very useful information. Now for a long, not a long time, but you know, in the, 17th and 18th century people were looking at this particular work and going well this is completely satire and it's making fun of the religious systems of the ancient mediterranean particularly those that worshiped isis right. and then some serious scholars in the 19th century and into the 20th century sat down with this text and really started looking at it and saying you know with what we know about mystery religions you couldn't write a book you could not write a holy text per se that's absolutely um, yeah, and we, we, we couldn't write a holy text per se. So maybe what Apuleius was doing is actually explaining cultic activity from his perspective, using literary devices, which were very common of his period, to both put it out there to the public while still disguising it for those that really were not going to have insight into cultic activities involving mystery cults. So it was a way to both make it public and camouflage it at the same time. And so a lot of time has been spent. Like, I don't, I'm not a classicist. Um, we, uh, I don't go in there and read it for the enjoyment of reading it. I mean, I did enjoy reading it the first time, but I've had to go back in the text again and again. I read it by rote and I look for information that I need for analysis on religious activity as it involves um, you know, in particular, this particular case, the mystery cult involving ISIS, um, but also to compare and contrast other cultic systems that were in place, you know, during the same time period. And it's, it's invaluable. Um, I think people that have talked about it, uh, you know, going back to Burkert and others, but even like more recently, Ogden and um, um, uh, Hugh Bowden, um, Bowen has been very good about this. Like, you 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 go in and you lift as much of the text out, compare it against the other sources source we have, like Plutarch, and then archaeology and whatever we can to shore up what we think to be the strongest elements of it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, if you if you so you know I'm trying to immerse myself in Plutarch, the book, uh, the translation of the Book of the Dead, of however good this is. Uh, also reading through. Diodorus of Sicily, and I'm getting an, a picture. Mary, you know, other and 
uh, newer scholars work like Mary Beard, stuff like that, right. on what this cult of ISIS was, what this temple of ISIS looked like. And I compare it to what Apuleius is saying, and he's spot on the money. Right. So you can tell by the way he describes it. He's educated in this subject. He's not just making stuff. It's not just some Saturday Night Live skit. They're just making stuff up. It's not really. I guess you could say it is sat- satirical in the way that it's not a real story. And it's making fun of some guy named Lucius who turns right. into an ass. But it gets serious. It gets real serious. He, he wants, in, to, in, he wants in, to get his life saved. And he wants to get salvation. Book 11. Book 11 it, is where the, it all turns it, out. It, yeah. The entire. It, 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 I always look at this as like. I try to explain to my students, like if this was a movie, this would be a religious rom-com, right? It's this quirky buildup, you know, making fun of the world, being part of it, realizing that you're, you yourself are a flawed being and you're looking for that thing to make you all right. It's the romantic encounter. And in this case, the rom-com is with a divinity because, you know, the other uh, romantic involvements are deities that don't work out and don't perform. Apuleius bounces around trying to figure out what god, goddess, or you know, magician is going to be able to fix him once he's turned in to yeah. from man to beast. And it's it's this like, well, this didn't work, that didn't work, this didn't work, but now I found it. And then it's this like, mm-hmm. again, this epiphany. She's yeah. the one, and I love her, and I'm going to stay with her forever. And she sends him a vision, sort of like Paul. Like Paul gets his little his little vision from Jesus and everything. He she, she says, "Go to Rome," and he goes to Rome, and that's where he finds this whole entire movement. I, I, basically, I, I would say that Apuleius is his uh, vision's way better than Paul. It it's is, got yeah. more description elements to it. Yeah, it, it's, it, yeah, it's definitely more detailed. Right, but it's like any other epiphany you would hear in any other religious text. We're like, oh, I was lost, but now I'm found. It, it's exactly. Happened. It's Same exactly story. what he says, basically. I mean, yeah. if you read it without being overly critical, well, it doesn't say lost and found. Well, it says it's the same literary description of having been misled and then now finding truth. I mean, that's the same kind of imagery we get from the text. Yeah. And I want to just highlight something real quick before you show these these slides. It says something really interesting in the first section, which is this same section right here. But it says that when he gets there, he says, I was the keen to purify myself at once, so I bathed myself in sea waters, path- plunging my head seven times beneath the sea. For Pythagoras of godlike fame proclaimed the numbers to be especially officious and sacred rites. And that's when he gets into this uh, hymn to the goddess oh, Isis. That's a baptism. That's what that sounds like. Well, so yes, in you know, in a pagan context, it was ritual purification with water. Right. Um, unlike the Christian system, and although some Christians early on did have multiple baptisms, and eventually, you know, by Nicaea, we have the formalization of the fourth century, one baptism, that's it. But prior to that, ritual purification with water is still heavily Jewish in the first and second century. So we have Christians doing things like a baptism and then occasional ritual purification with the water, and sometimes effectively what was the it's not as common, but multiple baptisms um, early on, particularly early second century. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a newer, this is a second temple thing for the Jews. This is, this is after they come back from their captivity. So they might've borrowed this because this, you see this in the East too. You see this in Zoroastrianism and Hinduism. The, 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 they would, they would basically do a baptism in the, uh, what what river was it? not the Hindus the other one the um the there's a god god is named after him. I'm trying to think of the name uh that's all you man yeah I've tr- I, 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 the Ganges Ganges yeah Ganga yeah they call it the Ganga they would dip their head in there just like and get saved that's how you got saved the god the Ganges they had a, and that was the name of the goddess Ganga and that's like it's so you see this all over the, this is like a common trope. Jewish mikvah for ritual purification with water was was a common thing in you know developing out of it wasn't pre second temple it was post second temple and it was you know roughly around 250 is when we start seeing mikvah appear in the archaeological record right so it's something that's developing and who else throughout the Mediterranean other cultures are engaging in this activity of ritual purification through bathing 
Well, if you remember, this guy named Alexander, Greeks were into bathing, and then later Romans are into bathing. So bathing could be something you do just to stay clean, and then bathing can be something you do to ritually purify yourself um, in preparation for certain religious activities. And it was pretty common throughout the Mediterranean. Now, in some cases, some cultures, you could do an extensive purification, wash from head to toe, be immersed. In other cases, you can um, just ceremonially wash your hands and then your head. But, you know, ultimately, it's the investiture in the ritual that is the purification, not the water itself. It's the activity, the belief in the activity. So, you know, that's right. the, the nexus between ritual and belief that's really important. And if you actually think about it, if you actually like try to level with this idea, when you take a shower, you come out, you feel you feel good. You feel, you feel good. fresh. You feel renewed. You can only imagine in a world that's really uh, superstitious and sort of magical thinking. Everything's it's all gods and goddesses everywhere. You got to imagine they thought there was some sort of power behind this thing. You know, even 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 better, since we're talking about ritual purification with water and, you know, I, we're leading in because I know I can't not talk about Christianity and the parallels if I'm sure. a Gnostic informant or myth vision. That's but I, I think it's important to note, like n one of the preparatory activities typically was the avoidance of bathing. Christians did it. Other cults did it. So don't bathe for 10 days. Then come in and have your ritual purificating bath. Wow. Wait a minute. So I'm being purified, but I challenge anyone in a modern context to live work and do your daily activity for 10 days, then jump in a shower and not feel absolutely awesome afterwards. And Especially in Christianity, in climate too. it would be months sometimes where for a month you wouldn't bathe, you would wear rough clothing and you'd actually get sores all over your body. Wow. Right. So then when you bathe, you were actually cleansing and purifying, not only your soul, but physically your body. But we're not wow. going to talk about Christianity anymore if we don't have to. Well, no, I don't. That's, that's really fascinating stuff right there. That's, now I want to, I want to after we talk about this book real quick. I want to get into who Isis was, what was her per, and then Osiris as well. I want to, I was, I want to get into this whole, what was going on with this and how it got to the Romans. But let's let's right. start off with this. So do you want me to read this? Oh, I'll I'll read it. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I'll let you read first. It's your channel. And yeah, we can take back. back and forth. Yeah, we switch back and forth. So this is from the Metamorphosis, the same book that I was just reading from. It was not yet midnight when I sort of just for people who some people like to listen and they can't read and they're just like doing stuff in their house. So, I, you know, trying to be fair to them as well. It was not yet midnight when I awoke with a sudden start to see the full moon just rising from the sea waves and shining with unusual brilliance. Now, in the silent secrecy of night was my opportunity, knowing that this greatest of goddess was supremely powerful, that all human life was ruled by her providence. Now, Plutarch also mentions this, that the whole universe was controlled by Isis and Osiris. He makes them look like they're the biggest deal in his time period. Okay. That not only animals, but tame and wild, but even lifeless things here animated by the divine power of her right and might, that as she waxed and waned, so in sympathy and obedience, every creature on earth or in the heavens or in the sea was increased or diminished. And seeing that fate was now seemingly saturated, with, with my long tale of suffering and was offering me hope. However, late in the day of rescue, I decided to beg for mercy from the awesome manifestation of the goddess that I now beheld. That is some deep stuff right there. Yeah, and interestingly enough, he, he initially picks a goddess, and it's not Isis. So we'll move on, but like he goes, well, I see the moon and I see the ocean, I'm going to pray to the moon goddess, right? And so he's just looking for any deity. And I think it's important to realize that in many like epiphanies, he's going to seek her out. He's going to seek a god out or a god, in this case, a goddess out. And then Isis is going to reveal herself. So it's not like he went looking for Isis. Isis found him. Right. Again, Paul That's... wasn't looking for Jesus. Yes. Jesus found him. So the That's... parallel, again... We said we were going to do it, but the parallels with other religious texts that are similar in, in period of time are, are somewhat common. It also goes to see how some of this religious activity was viewed among pagans and other religions alike. In this case, he 
Apuleius is having the God revealed to him, not him revealing himself to a God, which I think is important for the understanding that this is a personal relationship with the deity. The deity's working on their be your behalf. They're sending you a vision. Right. And I think that's important for you to understand. This is, again, a form of, you know, divine um, contact, or if you want to say use the word divination, but this is the God, in this case, God is revealing herself. Yeah. And that they call, I mean, they, they I think it's Plutarch, but a lot of people call her the goddess of many names. Right. And it seems to be there's a connect, a clear connection between the Illusionian mysteries with Demeter, the goddess of the, the ear grain, the goddess of corn of, you know, and then Isis sort of be in that same role down in Egypt. And the Romans sort of just synchronized the two. Okay. Demeter is Isis basically. And, uh, I, but you could see, you could see another connection with Ishtar as well. And that's, you know, again, we're talking about divine feminine, right? So yeah. I will think, I think the Greeks, in addition to the Romans, were already, the Eleusinian mysteries were ancient. Yeah, that's true. Right? But And and but, and I don't want to say they were stagnant, because, but they appear to have been somewhat stagnant. Um, and then now you breathe this new breath of religious innovation into a region and give it a couple centuries to percolate, you get a system or a mystery cult like ISIS, which shares a lot of things with other mystery cults as well. So it's important to remember, like there were a lot of people not just going, let's do the same old, same old, like we've been doing for three, 400 years as a, as a society. It was like, Hey, have you heard of ISIS? She has a mystery cult too. And Oh, I heard it's better. Right. And now the innovation occurs. Yeah. And so, and this, the, these statues of Demeter, uh, you they're like interchangeable with with Isis, particularly and, from the first century CE forward. Yeah, yeah, that's when it all starts, to, and then they start making Pluto, um, sculpt or you know statues. And Tal, I forgot which Ptolemy it was, two or three or four, whatever. One of the Ptolemies, he has a vision where he's he in the vision. It's like go get that statue of Pluto or of Pluto that's in right. Sinop, in yeah. the middle of well modern day Turkey, right by right. the sea. And bring it to Egypt. That's Serapis, right? Well, like, and so that just and shows you what kind of mind the syncretism mentality was going well, on. And Serapis, maybe we should talk a little about Isis before we go on. Yeah. So when we look back in the archaeological record, I'm not an Egyptologist. So if there's an Egyptologist in the argent, uh, Egyptologist in the art and the audience, I apologize for my generation of dates and dynasties. I know how right, right. upset you guys can get over this. Yeah. <laughs> but between the 13th and 12th century CE we see the first temples formally dedicated to um, Adobidos for uh, the cultic revival of Osiris, right? Cultic activity where Osiris is actually, um, the cultic activity in Egypt is the rituals, the statues are taken out. Um, the Pharaoh, in this case, um, is acting in the rebirth ritual, the Pharaoh, as he's alive, is given life by through Horus. At death, he assumes the role of Osiris. This mimicked this reality in the of the rulers was mimicked in the cultic activity and mythology of Egypt. And so, that, as the famous right, statue right there of Pluto, or this could be Pluto, or it's Serapis. This exactly, is, you, you don't know. It's yeah. the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we see what happens is the establishment of this cultic activity where initially Osiris is the important figure. We see outside the temple, the, and this is, has to do with the Pharaoh um, in his role as now deceased Pharaoh, right? Um, being ritually purified or being publicly displayed and then brought inside these temple complexes, but were closed to everybody else then undergoing a ritual purification prior to quote unquote being sent off, right? As Osiris. Right. So this cult of activity was very important. It was it was commemorated in festivals as well. Um, but both the internment of pharaohs and then cultic activities were mirroring this part of its public, part of its private. Now, that may have given some early Greeks some ideas, right? Like, hey, so there's public out front and then private religious. I'm not saying it is, but in Egypt, we see that again, 13th, 12th century. Then we jump forward way ahead in time. Cult, you know, we got Eleusis, the Elson and Mysteries, you know, coming up later. But sometime around the fourth century, we see a shift in some of the 
cultic concepts. When we were talking earlier, Isis was a pretty small character. Her role was I'm Horus's mom and I'm I, I'm Osiris's wife. And yeah. my job is to stand around and make sure Horus is born and Osiris is raised from the dead. That's kind of the only thing she does. So she's in a way, she's a secondary deity in Egyptian mythology, even in 13th century BCE. Yeah. In the in Late, fact, the, yeah. the Book of the Dead, the, if you look, if you read through it, it's not a lot of hymns to her. It's all not. Osiris and Amun-Ra. That's it. Right. And so what we see is her role is going to shift as more and more important. Prior to the Greeks getting there in the you know fourth century, it's the late fourth century, we see in the fourth century, the earlier part of the fourth century, we start seeing a lot more ISIS activity. ISIS yeah. becomes much more prominent. And we see the establishment very quickly in maybe the late fifth, but definitely in the fourth century BCE, we see the establishment of Serapis as a deity. Yeah. Now, who is this guy? You know, he's a God that all of a sudden appears. He's associated right with the Apis bull, depending on which source you want to read. Um, you know, everybody seems to be a little curious. Is he a conflation um, with Osiris himself? He's a deity of healing. He, you know, he's kind of seems to be all that in a bag of chips yeah. and he's very popular. And what we see is a decrease in the role of Osiris and the rising of Isis. Yeah. Isis becomes more important a thousand years later than she had been earlier. And the Greeks love her and associate continually worship and associate Serapis and Isis together. Yeah. And, and, and Serapis seems to be this like all God, this all they, he's, he's being syncretized with Pluto, the God of the underworld, who is right. also Hades. And then the Apis bull, who right. is the, basically the, like it's it's like another incarnation of, of Osiris, but they take this Correct. Apis bull and this Osiris and that's Serapis. And so you could and you could argue that that's also depicting Zeus and other Greek deities that were right. associated with you know with those symbols. So again, yes. Serapis becomes a deity who starts off as like, yeah, I'm just a a doctor that heals people. To oh, by the way, I'm a chief deity. In I'm the everything. pantheonic system yeah, in the fourth century, gods rolled into one basically male deities, right? Right. So we and have then, this pair Isis divinity, becomes, and then Isis becomes the female. As she becomes salvation incarnate. That's what I like Correct. to say. That, I don't know. That, if I, and that's very I don't know fair. if someone else has said that before, but I've from my own gathering, from reading all the stuff that's that uh, written on her from Plutarch, Diodorus of Sicily, all like the first century and later people, she is the salvation goddess. Yes. Like you want to be saved, you go to Isis. Yes. And I think that's very fair. And I think that's a very fair analysis based on what evidence we have, both literary and archaeological. Yeah. Um, I'll read the next one. So sure. continuing on in this story. Um, and the reason some of the texts is you guys, um, what I do is I, when I'm doing this with my students, I try to go, let's pull out the information that we need to know um, to extent, understand the rituals and the belief system. And some of the rest is just filler because it's, it's literature, right? So you're revealing secrets and beliefs in the form of literature. So, um, again, this is uh, um, our main character talking. And what's funny is I think this is Apuleius, but the, the parallels between him and the character are pretty funny. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. Queen of heaven, whether you are Ceres, nurturing mother, uh, critics of crops, who, if of your joy at finding your daughter again, is set aside the action, the ancient acorn, fodder for wild beast, and taught man to use of civilized foods. And now fructify the plow lands of Eleusis. So I, I stop here when I'm teaching this class. Let's see what this says. Ceres, Demeter, because that's who he's talking about with the finding of your daughter, right. right? And now the cult, the Eleusinian mysteries, talking about those regions, okay? Big and deal. whether you are Venus, or, um, who is the first beginnings of the world by giving birth to love, brought together the opposite sexes so that this, with never ending regeneration perpetuated the human race. And now you are worshiped in the sanctuary of the Seagirt Paphos, um, or whether you are Phobius's sister, again, the son, um, um, who by re revealing women in, uh, by relieving women in labor um, with your soothing remedies have raised up many peoples. And now you are venerated at in your shrine at Ephesus, and whether you are, are Persephone, um, Prosperine, um, or the fearful night howling of the triple countenance, you hold back um, the attacks of ghosts and control the gates of hell, who pass at will among the sacred groves and are 
propitiated with many different rights. So I think that's important to remember too, is I look at the conflation of the ice of Isis cultic worship and the mystery cult with the Eleusinian mysteries. Cause that's a system that I, I study quite in some detail when I'm studying the Western black sea. And it is interesting to me. I find this absolutely fascinating that it's almost as if Appalachia is making commentary that that older cultic system just doesn't do it for him. Mm. It's, it's part of the problem with the cultic system involving uh, the Eleusinian mysteries is kind of you went twice and you were kind of done with it, right? Yeah, it you was had that ecstatic experience, and it was right. supposed to make you not no longer fear death through right. the ritual. But but you but, there was no that. fraternal organization. You weren't expected to uh, maintain cultic activity every year. It was kind of a one two. You're done if you wanted to be, and that's not the case with what we know about cultic activity involving ISIS. First of all. Um, once you were a member, an initiate in the cult, you you were always a member of the cult. You stayed a member. You were expected to attend all of the ritual activities in the calendar. Now, why do we not know what the calendar really is? Is because, oh, by the way, the calendar was sacred too, because they didn't worship in public where the rest of society could see, except very occasionally. Right. There were got, certain I, activities I, where they operated outside of their temple, and typically their temples were surrounded by a wall. So you didn't see what was going on inside. They did. And then they came out and they would engage with the public and then go back in and perform a lot of what their ritual activity um, included, particularly at Pompeii, Herculaneum, places where we can actually, this is actually a depiction at Herculaneum. Um, and it's important to understand that some, this is archaeological evidence, right? Um, yeah. Vesuvius erupts in 79 AD. Um, but this is from uh, a period before that, probably, you know, sometime between 30 and 50, this frescoes um, painted and it's detailing Isaac worship. Now you look at it and you're like, well, Pat, how do you know it's Isis? We know it's Isis because at the top of the stairs, the guy's bald, the kind of white dude who in the middle is holding a sacred jug, which probably contains the sacred water of Isis, which again was the water, holy that, water, holy water <laughs> for all intents and purposes, but it was the water of the Nile or ceremonially believed to be of the Nile that gave rebirth and re regeneration. It was the water of life, literally, is how you could translate it. Wow. On each side is someone. Now, the, the foreign nature of the cult was really important as well because you notice that there are Egyptians present in the audience as priests. So that's how the cult actually gets started in the Mediterranean. Priests are imported from Egypt to teach the non-Egyptians how to worship Isis. Over time, Greeks and Romans take over a lot of these roles, but there's this contact with Egypt being, Isis being an Egyptian god and being serviced by Egyptian personnel, so to speak, as far as priests and priestesses. Because the reading of hieroglyphics seem to be part of the ritual practices involving the cult. Whether or not it's through rote, or if it was actually something the priests learned to do, we don't know, but the Egyptian priests probably knew hieroglyphics, whether or not Romans did anything other than memorize them. They may not have actually been literate in them, but they they memorized text as they were taught to them verbally. Um, at the top of the stairs, you know, man and woman, each of them are holding a sistrum, right? So well, well, the sistrums are these rattles um, made of, you know, bronze, oh, copper. I guess you can make them of wood as well. But we, we have some examples, right? Um, and they're even made of silver and gold, at least according to some sources like Plutarch. Now, these are important to remember because this is also part of the ritual activity. Why do you, now a lot of gods and goddesses had this musical instrument as part of their um accoutrement, so to speak? But with Isis, it's one of the most common symbols associated with their cultic activity. Um, I, I don't know how many, but when you survey them, about half of the ones I've looked at are immediately recognizable. And then somewhere in the four in the background, you if they're not holding the system in their hand, it's like detailed in the a relief or something where you're like, oh, there it is. And so many, many of the people that were uh initiates into the cult represented it in the iconography to let people know, oh, by the way, even if it didn't say, and someone just said I was initiated of the cult of Isis in, in the inscription. And sometimes they don't have it, but you're like, they're showing the objects associated with cultic activity. So they are probably yeah. a member of the cult as well. And, um, and if the um if the Sphinx doesn't give it away, look at right. the ibises. Right. What, what other cult uses the ibis, which is a representation of Thoth, basically? 
right. the messenger and, of the gods. Well, and right, like this is the important thing to remember too, is like Greeks thought of Toth as something like Hermes. Yeah. But Hermes was like the cheap market. It was the definitely the Walmart version yeah. of how the Egyptians had viewed him, right? Wow, that's true. Um, but this is the conflation going on. The fact that, you know, we never knew how the processions look. Now, this is a totally artistic representation of cultic activity. And I think it's really important not to get bogged down on how many stairs there are and right. where everybody's standing. But it does appear that the activities were done in private um, in the temple complexes at, like, for example, Pompeii, Herculaneum and other places. Um, there was a temple uh, to Isis established in Rome, like these places where we definitely know Athens, for example, where we know. But we also know that there were, you know, ritual activities associated with the mystery cult that give us a lot of information. And the artwork like this helps reinforce what we see in literary texts. Right. Yeah, and it's a these temples. This is this is another. This is one. This one's in Egypt. It's an ISIS temple. It's just they're so well. They, they, they look so well built and important. You know what I mean? Like you can tell these are. This is a real important place of worship. You know, it's just. And if you were a Roman or a Greek visiting Egypt and you saw those temple complexes, and by the way, a lot of the temples to ISIS are later. They're from like just yeah. pre-Ptolemaic or Ptolemaic period, right? But you're still just, it's been 300 years, right? It's the first century CE. And you're seeing that and you're like, I'm sold. And then you go yeah. back to Rome or Pompeii and you see something much more like what you're showing now. But that's, that's still a fascinating. And, but you notice one thing about this temple complex, people from the outside can't see into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not public ritual activity. This is private ritual activity. And, they, and the stairs go up, but then they go back down. Yep. <laughs> that's crazy. So yeah, that's um. We got. Want to do? Want to go to the next one? Sure. All right. I come, Lucius, moved by your entreaties. I, mother of the universe, mistress of all elements, firstborn of the ages, highest of the gods, queen of the shades. First, this reminds me of uh, Game of Thrones with uh, Daenerys Targaryen with all the titles. <laughs> First of those who dwell in heaven, representing in one shape all gods and goddesses. Wow. That's that's a bold statement right there. It is. My will controls to the shining heights of heaven, the health giving sea winds and the mournful silences of hell. The entire world worships worships my single godhead. That's a word that we're going to we, we can talk about. Godhead in a thousand shapes with diverse rites. Now we were talking about Ishtar and Illusion and Demeter and Ceres. But anyways, Diverse rites under many different names. The Phrygians, firstborn of mankind. And that's, that's interesting that they knew that because we look at Quebec, Quebec Tepe is the oldest thing. Well, we and, and we also, you and I talked about Magna Mater, right? Yeah, this is as old as it gets. So they this so that's that's what I'm trying to say. He is highly educated, Apuleius. He knows what he's writing. This is not he's not just making this up. This is good. But anyways, firstborn of mankind. Call me the what is that? Was that where Pasunician mother? Yeah, I, I don't even try. I just know they're talking mother, about the Phrygian mother of the, the gods. The Phrygian mother of the gods. The native Athenians, the Ser the S Sacropian Minerva, the yeah, island which is dwelling, Athena. Yeah, exactly. Yep. The island dwelling Cypriots, Paphian Venus, uh, the archer Cretans Dictanan, Diana, the triple tongued Sicilian Stygian Persephone, the ancient Eleusinian Actian Ceres. Some call me Juno, some Bellona, others Hecate, others Ramusia. But both races of Ethiopians, those on whom the rising and those on who the setting suns, the Egyptians, who excel in ancient learning, honor me with the worship, which is truly mine, and call me by my true name, Queen Isis. I am here in pity for your misfortunes. I am here with favor and goodwill. Seize your weeping, seize now your weeping, put an end to your lamentation, banish your grief. Now, by my providence, the day of your release is dawning, and therefore, with your whole mind to the orders I give you, she's saving them. Right. And understand this is this is salvonic. Exactly. I think it's really important to understand. Like she's one of the goddesses that she's conflated with a lot of times. You'll hear the term Isis Fortuna. If if you're familiar with literature of the period and in archaeology, we'll see dedications to Isis Fortuna, 
particularly with soldiers, by the way, because your war is important to have luck on your side. Yeah. But like now she controls good and bad fortune. Every like, so she's there for you when you're down and she is the one that perpetuates good luck. One thing we probably don't have too much time to talk about, um, but I'll just give you this little aside. Apollaeus starts off poor and goes like he's on financially bad luck, but he's an attorney. He's a lawyer. Um, but he's not winning his cases and not making money through this journey, you know, it takes a bunch of chapters. He eventually starts becoming initiated in the cult. We'll talk about a bit more, but one of the things people go is, well, you know, he starts complaining about how much it costs, but mirrored in the text after he's committed to ISIS worship, his fortune starts increasing. And even though he's paying money to the temple, he's getting more back out of it than he's putting into it. Where have you heard that before? It was a form of prosperity gospel that's mirrored in the text. Oh, no. Every time he goes, well, that's expensive. He then gets, he pays it because he knows that he's supposed to, but he complains. Well, that's a lot of money. And then next time he realizes he's wealthy. And that through the worship of ISIS, he's become a wealthy man. Wow. So it's kind of a prosperity gospel kind of built into the text very subliminally. Wow. That's, that's so, so what you're seeing now, so this is this is the the author connecting all these worships of all these goddesses into one and saying this is the whole shebang right here. This is the goddess of all things. But this also like we, like we talked about earlier, this is also something happening with Serapis. So they're both right. sort of this sort of new religious movement that starts with Augustus. Augustus has a really successful career and ends up being the 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 real sole dictator of the Roman Empire, in his last 15, 20 years of his of his reign, he's just obsessed with religion. And according to Mary Beard, he dedicated over 70 temples. Right. And a bunch of them were Egyptian. Right. And and so this whole new movement of Egyptian religion and, and mystery cults springs up. And we were talking before we went before we went live. I think this is what I think what Augustus did, and by the way, he has all these weird stories written about him through Tacitus, Suetonius, of there being a star in the sky when he was born. And the the um, the um Senate, just like Herod, he didn't want the baby to be born. So he went, they went searching, making sure nobody had kids that they would, and that everybody had to hide their babies for a whole year because they, they knew that was the year that a, 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 an emperor or a great king would be born. Yeah. And the Senate didn't want a king. They had a republic. Anyways, long story short, Augustus becomes the emperor. And he implements all these mystery cults, dedicates all these new uh, temples, and he makes you have to get married. I think he made homosexuality illegal or something. Yeah, like. he he frowned he on it heavily. All, all of or these, at least at least if it was interfering with you having kids, right? He basically, he, said men, your first job is to make he becomes babies. A, he becomes a, a fundamentalist, basically. He's a re religious fanatic in a sense. He's he's a he's a theocratic. Uh, he's like you know he's he's, he's a theocratic uh, fascist. Mm -hmm. He even in, in, used that symbol, the fascist. That's where it comes from. Yeah, he actually, and interestingly enough, he uh, he was also probably heavily misogynistic, much more than Julius Absolutely. Caesar was. Julius, women actually had a pretty good run under Julius Caesar. <laughs> under Augustus, though, women are suppressed heavily because yeah. um, he starts limiting the rights of women in certain instances and, well, and, and issues regarding divorce and other things. Well, I, the, and the reason why I brought that up is because I, I don't think, we, me and Derek were just talking about this for Myth Vision. It's not, it can't be a, just a coincidence that within a century of Augustus making all of these moves and reforming um, Rome into this religious sort of, uh, you know, fundamentalist religious land, but not revival, not Roman revivalist. House yes. House. And all Return the to the state, right? The true right. worship. And I, I don't think it's a, mis an, a coincidence that within a century later, Christianity comes up. There's a soil that is just ripe for Christianity just to come out of. And you get all these sort of, sort of cult or um, anti Augustan, but right. they're, they're but they're following suit for what what is a mystery cult or what is a you know for for, for the times basically it's countercultural right it's like counter so so you I think you and Derek are definitely right on this um, when you survey the literature you start looking at the parallels just start point to point the imagery associated with Augustus the imagery associated with Jesus. Again, we weren't going to do this, but we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, and we look at, there were, during Augustus's reign, there were rebellions in the province of Judea, Roman Palestine. 
that the Romans had to suppress. Now, some of them actually appear in the historical record. Um, again, you know, um, the uprising of Judas the Galilean and other people that occurs during this period. There's a lot of fomenting and anger. The Roman legions go in there and they crush yeah. these uprisings. And this again, is while Herod, who is correct. set up by the Augustan regime to be the tax collector, basically, right. to be the, the puppet. The, he, that's that's his, his Augustus' his right-hand man, right. Herod. And that's during his sort of, uh, you know, so when you, in the Gospels, they may turn Herod into this evil character. Like you said, it's countercultural. Right. But it's also, it's also following the, the, the pattern, the evolution of how religion is done. So I'm just going to say, like, I always joke about this. So there are real motorcycle gangs out there, right, in the United States. They're like the criminal one percenters that, you know, Hell's Angels, all these other guys that, you know, had their heyday being like completely anti-law enforcement. Then there were other people going, well, I want to be in a motorcycle gang, but I don't want to join the Hell's Angels. So I'm going to join a chaplain biker gang. <laughs> totally, completely opposite. We don't drink. We're totally straight edge. Such but we a- want the motif of these other guys. That's such so a- we're going to wear leathers. Yeah. We're going to buy hogs, right? We're going to buy Harley Davidson's, but we're going to be completely different than them, but we're going to mirror everything they do, but we're going to do it in our own self-righteous way. That is the best way to describe it. That's, I couldn't, well, well said. Yeah. Do you want to read this last one so we get the Super Chats or? Sure. I like this one. It's one yeah, of my favorites. This like, is a great one. This is, a great this one. is the promise, right? This yeah. is what you get for joining this cult. But this you must remember well and keep forever stored up in your inmost heart your secret place it can be translated that way as well. The remaining course of your life right up till your last breath is now solemnly promised to me. This is an attestation of faith to a divinity. That's not transactional. It's complete. This is kind of uncommon in the ancient Mediterranean. It is only that it is only just that you should make over all the rest of your time on earth to her by whose benefits you will be made human again. You are now devoted to me for the rest of your existence. Where have you heard this before? (laughs) And you will live happily and you will live gloriously under my protection. And when you have completed your lifespan and descend to the shades, by the way, remember, she's the queen of shades, which is the queen of spirits, which is the afterlife. There is all there also in that subterranean hemisphere. I, whom you now behold, shall be there. I'll be meeting you at the pearly gates. We've heard that before shining amidst the darkness of Asheron and reigning in the secret depths of sticks. I'll make your transition to the underworld as painless and easy as possible. And you shall dwell in the Elysian fields. Now this is heaven among heavens. Yes. An exalted stated status, exalted status. Where have you heard that before? I have many mansion mansions and some are greater than others. Um, and constantly worship me and be favored by me in the afterlife, by the way. You've heard that in other books as well. But if by diligent observance and pious service and steadfast chastity, you shall have uh, deserved well of my Godhead, know that I alone also have the power to prolong your life beyond the bounds fixed for you by your fate. So not only are you going to be exalted in heaven, more or less the underworld, the afterlife, but you're going to live longer on earth. Wow. So you're like, we'll extend your days. So. So what we just saw in those three in those three um, slides, we saw a baptism. Well, I read that before. Right. We see him get converted, and then we see him get saved. Right. But three steps, and that's that's all through ISIS, and the God revealing herself, like a an actual and a revelation. You're right. Uh, yeah, and and you know that I think that's the really important thing to remember is that ISIS cultic activity mirrored this this concept of. So how do you join a mystery cult? Well, most of them were somewhat easy. ISIS doesn't seem to be that easy. So if we use literature and other things that we have, one thing we have to look at is, so you didn't just join, you had to learn about it first. You had to undergo some form of catechesis. Now, um, Apuleius describes Lucian's journey sort of like this. I was interested, so I went down and lived by the temple. Right? And there I learned things. So he didn't get to go in. He's but he started friend. asking questions and was learning things by the priests. Then he was initiated and allowed to formally join the cult. Right? It's like it's like Fight Club. You sit outside for a little bit. Right. You got to learn, much. right? <laughs> um, and so 
then he's allowed to come in and he goes through an initiation where he wears in crappy robes undergoes secret rites which he doesn't really describe by the way other than the most simplest terms and then he emerges the next day after his ritual purification which involved likely the sacred waters of the nile um as a newly born person as a new person clothed in new robes they give you new robes this imagery is the same thing in christianity by the way following baptism in the christian in the early christian church exactly the same thing you and then he emerged holding a torch and being you know even though it was daytime he emerges now holding light that was his first year like his first then he's got to come back that was the mysteries of the initiatory mysteries of isis then he comes back he says a year it may have varied we don't know but a year seems reasonable because it mirrors other mystery cults um he comes back and he now goes and gets initiated into the mysteries of osiris then he wants to move from the area around Athens to Rome and whether or not he had completed his training there, he's required to go through a third phase. Now there was probably three phases of initiation and then he returned back to fulfill the rites of Isis and became what was known as a leader, a pastor of Horoi, pastor of Horoi, basically a priest, but wow. the lowest ranking priest. So it's like you're in bro but there are other people higher than you. Those that yeah, you're maintain bottom, secret right? knowledge and do things, quote unquote, the high priest of the, of the order. Now, interestingly enough, um, a lot of scholarship has been spent because we don't know a lot. We have some pictures, some archeology, span some literary uh, evidence. And so a lot of scholars think, well, the robes were significant to your rank. So you, you started off with plain robe that was probably not white, probably some brown color. Um, you were initiated, you changed. You got your multicolored robe, which showed you'd passed the initial part. You came back when, and that was the initiatory part of the uh, ISIS um, initiation. Your first day, your you know, your first rank, your second rank. We're not going to consider the initiate before they get in a rank like the neophyte. Um, but then you consider the next step would be going back for your the rites of Osiris, where you're learning more secret things. Then you get a white robe, right, or white uh, outfit. And then you come back and then you receive, you start wearing your rights to ISIS, your robes to ISIS again. So you, you go through these color combinations. Now, that's where the scholarship's in, but I don't agree with that scholarship. I actually think what we see in the historical record, the archaeological record, is there were robes for public outings, robes that the, you wore in public. And then there's robes that you wore privately in the activities in the... Um, inside the interior spaces so in public processions you wore one set of clothing which was probably the white robe by the, or probably the colored robe by the way because plutarch and other people talk about it right then in private in your own interior if you if you had earned the second uh set up from that point you wore white robes the rest of the time um and then wow. you just wore one set for public and it could be the other way around i'm not so sold that i'm absolutely right based on literature, but one set, because what happens is, is in the account in Apuleius and in other places in the historical record, like Plutarch is it appears that they were locked away that one set of robes were, weren't allowed to be removed from the temple. And it, that set in all likelihood is the one that was used for internal activities. Cause remember when, um, again, Lucian goes for, goes to Rome, he has to buy new robes because he had to leave his at his previous places, he wasn't allowed to bring them with him. The clothes themselves were sacred and what the clothes looked like were sacred. And that's why I think the colored robes may have been, that's when I start just composing my own argument, maybe the colored robes were for interior use because we have depictions of white robes and whether or not someone would be willing to reveal that stuff in art of the time. I don't know if it's a true representation or a protected representation of the activity. So it's, there's a lot of scholarship on it, but this isn't my area of focus or research. So I leave it alone and, you know, just let other people and much smarter people than myself mull it around. And the last thing I want to say before we get to the super chats, what I found fascinating about Plutarch's analysis of all this is he says that Osiris is represented as moisture and renewal of crops. So the rain, the Nile River. And then he said Set, who is the evil brother, is dryness and fire, which is like you think of hell. Right. Dryness and fire. So this sort of duality, this sort of dualism that you see in Christianity and Gnosticism as well, right. you see that in Egypt. 
and Absolutely. especially reflected in the Hermetica that M. David Litwa translated. Yeah, and it's it's absolutely it. true. And so if you were going to use a Roman concept of evil, set fits right into that. Misfortune, by the way. Nothing worse than fire and no water, right, right. In, in the ancient world. Um, a drought. But I think it's important, like Sistrum, we're talking about the instrument, right, that these was associated with cultic activity. So one of the uses of this is driving away evil spirits. Right. And a lot of scholars have said, by the way, part of the reason these type of instruments are used in this type of ritual activity is to drive away the presence of evil spirits. If you're walking through town, strumming your sistrum, right, and engaged in other ritual activity, and if you're in the cult of Kybele, you're banging your drum, right, your tympanum, this type of noise, and it's actually music, was symbolically representing the driving away of evil because it hurts their ears, mm. right? Because spirits have ears. You didn't know that? but that's how they can hear and interact with the living. And so this music was disorienting because we know from uh, records that some, you know, instruments was believed that this would drive away like the, the spirits of set or drive set from the area. So again, you, you dispel demons in a Greek and Roman context or, yeah, you know, absolutely. Well said first super chat is from Gaius Windex who also has a Seraphis icon. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Do you think Isis and Mary have anything in common? Yes. Yeah, the representations of the divine feminine in the form of a mother, and I think if we actually could go back to the second and third century CE, early Christian fathers, that's how they're converting people in Egypt. Is they're just saying, "Hey, look, this picture here, that's not true, but this picture is." Like it's it's the same, it's the same thing. And yeah, you, having a divine mother is really important for a resurrection story. And if you read the Hermetica, they, the way they describe the birth of Horus, the birth of the Holy Child, it's like this glorious moment, like you sort of like in the Gospels. I mean, there's sort of you can sort of see there there's some um, heavily uh, influencing going on between these the sacred birth of the sacred child, the chosen one. You could almost argue. I mean, I don't necessarily think this is the strongest argument, but uh, people have argued it that ISIS is a virgin entity because she oh, self impregnates yeah. she doesn't actually have sex she scoops up the seed and places it inside her in some mythical tradition so it was more of a form of she didn't actually con, she didn't i think she just I, I think it's a weak argument but you can make that parallel if you want. from what i've heard or from what i've gathered there is an there are inscriptions and she has all these names and one of them is the virgin the, the, the virgin right. of the world so yeah. I mean, you could argue, oh, well, she has a million names. There's just right. a million names. Well, exactly. And but virginity there... being equated to sacredness, too. Right. That's an important concept as well. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Uh, the next one is from... Just trying to, there we go. Oh, I, mean, I, just skip, I think I skipped one. There we go. Is she connected to Gaia? Thank you, Mika Valen, for the super chat. Y yes, because she is all deities. And if you go back... She is the substrate upon which everything occurs because she's of the first, right? She's the greatest goddess. Oh. Yeah, and this I think one right here. actually in there, yeah. It says, right, um, this one. Your Ve Venus Urania. Okay, so if you know Hesiod, like I do, right? when, when you read this, I, I immediately went to Hesiod because it says, if you are Venus Urania, who in the right. first beginnings of the world, by giving birth to love, Eros, right. that's from Hesiod. Right. And, and, and Hesiod's theogony, it's Uranus and Gaia who give birth to Eros. So he's he's changing the name to v Venus Urania, which is interesting because Uranus is the god of heaven. Is basically he's he's reversing the roles and gender. He's actually yeah, making yeah, exactly. both creator beings female. Yeah. That, so that's that the, was the heaven movie. and the earth are both feminine forms that come together to create Venus Urania. Right. Yeah, that was a really, and I like how he did that too. That was a really, really well thought out idea to just put that into one. That Venus Arania gave birth to love, and like right. that goes back to, and Hesiod was a big deal. That's and that's, that's why like, she's co-opted with Aphrodite. Like 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 Isis Aphrodite is a common depiction of her as well. Isis, right. like if you just look at, go Google this sometime. Go to a museum index and hit Isis, and then Isis hyphen so that you can get all the other conflations and iconography. So it just much. keeps coming up. It's yeah, like, it's oh, so it's, it's, it's all of them. Yeah. Isis, was... Sophia, the wisdom, mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. So that was a great question too. Good question. Derek from Myth Vision Podcast. Everyone, if you haven't subscribed, of course, most of you have. 
So, but if you haven't, if you're one of those people living under a rock, hit that subscribe button. Here's my tith to the to the true gnosis. Ser- seriously appreciate both of you. Guys. Appreciate you too. As well. I think if the people in ancient cultures could give money to the temples in order to obtain eternal salvation and progress through the various ranks of initiation, you too should patronize both myth vision and um, uh, Gnostic informant and the Bitty Booty channel. Absolutely. And like I said, the descriptions in the chat in the cha- in the or the links in the description definitely go and subscribe to that. Like we're just all th- we're just three channels trying to get educated and have fun and read ancient texts and just with an open mind and get, go into it without any dogmatism, without any anything any right. trying to do any. We're just trying to read it and learn it and and appreciate it for what appreciate it is. all of it though, not just one narrow sliver because it's culturally affirming. Right. Like, you know, learn it all. If you can, you're not going to learn it all. You're going to die not knowing everything. Yeah. There's so much to learn that you'll in one lifetime is you just can't get to it all. So thank you for the super chat. Any examples of Osiris resurrection? So like as far right in front of me, I have something I can show him. If you, okay, go ahead. If you're, unless you got something first. No, I was just going to say actual depictions of resurrections are a little in the earlier context absolutely yeah um uh, it becomes a little less in the period we're talking about where the cult of isis is forming a misreligion again she her her theme is she's teaching you the secrets that she used to raise osiris right so right. that's the general thought so he's less important but earlier on yes there are depictions which is this is where you get this egyptian book this is one of the oldest of, all, of the oldest and there's this hymn it's called the perf- it's called the making of the perfect coup. The word coup is means like soul, but it all they also use it for like mummies, I guess, like the dead, I guess. Right. And um, this particular, if you and if everyone wants to look this up on their own, so they know I'm not making this up. It's from the Papyrus of New, British Museum, number ten thousand four hundred seventy seven, sheet sixteen. So if you want to look it up for yourself, I'm just going to read the it's an English translation. So I I want uh, I I, uh, I don't do hieroglyphics at all either. Yeah, so if you guys want, you can look up, look it up yourself. And make sure maybe there's a different translation, but this is the one I have, so I'm just gonna read it. And this is there's a long hymn. I'm not gonna read the hymn, but at the end of it, it says, "This shall be said over a figure of the deceased, which shall be placed in a model of the boat of the sun, and behold, he that reciteth it shall be washed and shall be ceremonial pure, and he shall have burnt offer burnt incense before Ra. He shall offered." wine and cakes which i guess could be translated as bread as well but wine wine and bread and roasted fowl for the journey of the deceased in the boat of ra every coup for whom such things are done shall have an existence among the living ones and he shall never perish he shall be like unto that of the holy god so he should be like that of the holy god osiris no evil thing whatsoever shall attack him and he shall be like unto happy coup in am Amentent, which is heaven, right. he shall not die a second death. He shall eat and drink in the presence of Osiris each day. So it's not exactly Osiris resurrecting, but it's you becoming one with Osiris. So Osiris doesn't, I mean, maybe he doesn't exactly resurrect in the same way Jesus does, but he's basically resurrection incarnate. He's the right. resurrection he, God. He is the resurrection. He's the renewal of crops every year. Mm-hmm. So it's like, he is resurrection. And like that's like Isis. She is salvation. And he is resurrection. So I guess when Christianity, I guess if you want to compare it to Christianity, they're sort of taking that and rolling it all into one. You know what I mean? Well, and interestingly for like, you know, some of the imagery associated with Isis is a triplicate form, by the way. We read that early on. Um, so, and triplicate deity representation were very common so like isis serapis and osiris or really osiris who is replaced by serapis and isis are very important but they're a duality but even then some people were like well i don't want to give up my triplicate deity so you know they would say oh yeah and osiris like yeah but i thought he was serapis it doesn't matter these are theological and religious constructs they don't have to make sense if if it's affirming and it's normative belief among your group, it, it, you know, the best thing to do is if everybody believes the same thing, you're all good. Whether or not it's true, it doesn't matter. 
Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. And like, people get so caught up in these little details. And it's like, look at the big picture. What's going on here? Like someone the other day told me, well, Ishtar never dies. So how are you going to say that she, the three day motif is the same? I go, she went into the underworld. She, it's just not a real story that happened in real life. This is a myth. Her going down to the underworld represents death. Right? And they're Kimberly, like, oh, she die. So that doesn't mean she's a resurrection. Okay. Kimberly in the chat has an awesome comment. And we didn't have time to talk about it, but like we talked about it afterwards. Like the numerous temples to Isis. Um, actually, it's up a little bit more. In Delphi. Oh, right? yeah. There are temples to Isis everywhere in Greece. They're usually associated immediately adjacent to, quote unquote, traditional, the Olympian and other deities um, uh, in the Greek mainland in Asia Minor. I think if we have the slides, we could pull up that last one that I have, which is the inscription yeah. in. Um, yeah. So we have other inscriptions. It's not just Apuleius, right? Um, did we get that one? It's the oh, second one I sent you. Oh, OK. This one? No, it's. Are you talking about the picture? No, yeah, the one with the picture on it has a quote and a picture. Here, let me let me throw it up. I'll share it. Okay, it's not in the slides. Yeah, here. I I think I sent you one later. I I amended our awesome thing. So if you can, it's loading now. Okay. Well, this is this is what happens when you do it on on the fly. Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. So go go to the last one because it's the same thing. Oh, so like this is a yeah. This is a dedication, Asia Minor, south of Pergamon, north of Smyrna. Um, you know, this is known oh, as Sinai. Wow. Um, and this dedication was actually made. So this inscription appears either on or at, which is adjacent to a uh, temple to Hephaestus. Yeah. And it, this is it. I am Isis, the mistress of every land. And I was taught by Hermes. And with Hermes, I devised letters, both sacred. She's talking about hieroglyphics and demotic so that not everything be written with the same letters this inscription is explaining cultic knowledge and common knowledge it also it's kind of alluded to i establish laws for mankind and ordinance that none can change i am the eldest daughter of chronos again getting back to this this concept i am the wife and sister of king osiris i am she who finds crops for men demeter i am the mother of king horus I am she that is called goddess by women. I am revealed mysteries wow. to men. I am taught them honor. I taught them to honor images of the gods. I am the queen of seamanship. Again, she's conflated as also the mother of ships, not the mother of dragons, but she's at all these boat launchings. By the way, that's where in Apuleius, that's where Lucian's going, by the way, is to the dedication of ships. That's like um, Oceana, the goddess yeah, of Oceana. Yeah. Correct. I am, I am, I make the navigable unnavigable when it pleases me. So I turn good into bad. I create the walls of cities. I am the lawgiver. Wow. Hail Egypt, which nourishes me. Like, and again, these other dedications throughout, this is just a temple dedication, right? And so you look at it and you're reading it and it may have been missed within the archaeological record if someone hadn't just uh, found it, recorded it, but her, she was everywhere. Yeah. And that's something else people understand. Like how popular was ISIS? Like we find dedications to ISIS in the Black Sea. We find dedications to ISIS everywhere. We find votives to ISIS everywhere. She was very popular. And in the Eastern Black Sea from basically Sicily East, you can't go anywhere without a temple. By the way, there's a there's temples to ISIS in the UK, in London. Yeah. Right. So I've seen that. She's she has temples everywhere in in, in the Roman Empire. Yeah, like like pre fourth century, she was the biggest thing that was out. Yeah, until religion, right? Well, until Christianity kind of eclipses everything, and you know, there's there's issues with these two groups competing. Um, oh, and by the way, to mention that when I, when I bring up these these parallels, when I, when I make my when I tell my say my opinion that I think Christianity borrows from a lot of these things, and people will say to me, "Well, come on, don't you think it's a little? Well, give me another example of anything else that done anything like this. That's that's such a grand conspiracy." Well, look at Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus seems to be borrowing from all these different myths too. Right. It's a it's a modern. It's a what it is is it's a le- evolution of religion over time. Right. Starts new religions, and then and, and, new, and uh, the, the Old Testament d- is borrowing from the Ugaritic text, Sumerian text, Egyptian text. Right. It, nothing's borrowed. new. Everything's nothing. just borrowed and, and blended, and then and then revamped. Right. Repackaged with some new addition on it, and that's why I find the studying of religion absolutely fascinating. Um, but you know. ISIS is all all really important. 
Um, and you can't learn it all. Um, there's great books out there. Um, I mentioned Hugh Bowen, great author. He wrote Mystery Cults of the Ancient World or Mediterranean. I don't know. It's in a couple prints, but, you know, study this stuff. Buy a book, um, the Oxford um, Handbook on Ancient Greek Religion. Read it. It talks about mystery cults. It talks about the Eleusinian Mysteries. Scholarship contained within one book for 50 to 60 bucks. It's softbound. And you just start working your way through it. And it's, it's you know, absent coming to one of my classes, of course. It's the best way to learn this stuff or, you know, somebody else. I don't want to put all the professors in the world out of the business. But, you know, go to the go to the texts that are being generated by this body of academic experts who can get you the special thing. Like, so someone goes, I'm an expert on mystery religions. I go, which ones? <laughs> because <laughs> there's so many to learn. Like, you right. can't be an expert on all of them. Yeah. And when someone says, yeah, I know all about all the mystery religions, I just go, mm -hmm. yeah, let's, yeah, right. let's, let's, let, let's see. <laughs> I'm going to call the guy that's an expert on this particular cultic activity and see if you know it. And when you yeah. don't, now you can shut up. Yeah. It's like, and then, oh, what, which, which Osiris, which, which, uh, Hermes, there's always different types of Hermes. There's always, depending on what location you're in, what region of the world you're in, there's always different, different temples and different statues and different cults. And then like, we, we, we look at it from our point of view from, from 2022 and we right. think it was all organized like religion is today it's like no this they didn't have phones to call each other and send emails and they were doing their own things in their own oh, location. absolutely absolutely and they weren't they weren't um worried about sometimes it not matching up right wait you said something different 100 years ago those people are dead we're changing it yeah we're not changing it completely, but we're modifying it. It's like, wait, I thought I thought I, was, I thought Dionysus was the son of Semele, and, and now he's the Persephone's son. Yep, we just changed it. We just felt like it. This that's just how it was done. Well, and also different regions had different traditions. Exactly, exactly. Myth Vision says tithe five, but here is two more to fit the seven numerology. <laughs> right, that's that's the way it should be. Everybody should donate at minimum seven bucks so that we can yeah. get you proper alignment. Yeah, we'll um, sprinkle the blood seven times on you, just like it says in Leviticus. Right. And then dip your head in the water seven times, like Apollo. You know, seven times seventy can't be something. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's and it, and it's funny that Apollaeus points out that it's a Pythagorean thing. Right, because it's all tied into these mysteries, right? How educated he was. He knew what well, he was about. Apollaeus had we talked about this before the show, and I think we should tell this audience. Like Apollaeus in his apologia, his apologia, um, he he actually says he joined more than one cult. He confesses that, Hey, I tried other stuff. Right. We, I'm of the opinion that this was his final indoctrination because if he's trying to create this piece of literature, he kind of craps on some of the earlier traditions he would have been indoctrinated into or induced in, um, um, not indoctrinated, um, but he was initiated into. It so reminds me of the typical I think, person yeah. that grows up as Catholic and then they go to, they, they end up becoming, more you know fundamental and to become a right. uh, evangelical and they're like the catholics oh that's some of the devil that's they're wicked that's what it's like but i, I don't mean to cut you up what were you saying no no but that's you know that, that's it i think what we're seeing is someone who's decided now in life they found the right one right yeah I and mean, it's typical for someone to try to find a spiritual path that's how it is um sabra Bosowick, thank you for joining the membership you're all you're the, you're awesome oh it's always nice to see your name in the chat and I think there's one more. And it's, yeah, it's, it's and I don't have an answer to that one. I saw that one it popped okay. up. I, I don't know. Lady Liberty is just ISIS. It's an interesting uh, observation. It is. Because you got to wonder, is ISIS related to Liberty? She sort of is, I guess. Um, but Le I think that's Libra from the from the 12 constellations. Right? From the Zodiac? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but if that's well, and, the, and, and the Romans had a concept of a goddess libertas, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. And that was Rome. Yeah. So there could, there could, I don't know. There. My answer is, I don't know. And, um, full refunds. Yeah. yeah. Because... Well, you could, you could always point to the text of Apollaeus where she says, I'm the goddess. That's... Right. Exactly. Isis. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If, if, if it's a, if it's a goddess, then it's Isis. Yeah. You'd always say that. You can always say she's just the power of all, you know? But um, yeah, this has been really good. We went, we've been doing this for over an hour and fifteen minutes, and thank you for your time. By the well, way, I love talking about this stuff, and we just scratched the tip of the iceberg on mystery religions. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that Neil can and Derek can finagle all the people that I want to watch because there's been so much good stuff on 
like I get excited and I'll send Neil a message like, Hey, I need to come on when that person like, don't do the thing. Cause I want to be in the audience. Yeah. There, you know, some of the that. scholars that come in that Derek and Neil have on, you guys realize they're the people whose research I turn to. Yeah. So I'm just regurgitating what some of these really smart people are saying. Cause you know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. I just wanted to show this real quick. This is booty, bitty boot of the channel and go and subscribe, hit the bell. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I can only upload maybe once, sometimes every other day. And it's another channel that you can get just as much good content from that you should be checking out. And it's, well, you got, you got Pat. You yeah. Got and <laughs> well, yeah. And you got me, but I also want to pitch something on f tomorrow on Friday at, uh, Oh, come on, Pat. You need those, uh, 7 PM Eastern. We are having the bitty Buddha goes to better, uh, funding. Like again, Neil is going to Israel to do great work. Content creators need to get out there. You yeah. to get content to get information for you, support them. So if after you've donated to Neil and Derek for their trip to Israel, if you have a few bucks left and you want to help get Biddy to better, go ahead and show up tomorrow tonight on, on the Tang network with, nice. you know, that's Oz and yeah. you know, Neil knows Oz we're doing tarot card reading um, magical tricks, things like that for fun and yeah. alcohol be involved, grab a couple beers or your favorite mixed drink, sit down, watch a show for a while, send in a, send in a, a small pledge, have your, have your tarot read by Biddy, who, by the way, knows nothing about tarot. So that's what makes it fun. She actually <laughs> has to consult her book to tell you what you have, um, her awesome. app on her phone and it'll be a lot of fun. And, um, tomorrow earlier in the day, I'll be on with Ryan, um, and uh diana and we're going to be talking magic and magic in the ancient world and more particularly we're going to be talking about hexes and how ancient hexes because that's what i know about and their modern equivalents so we're going to you know compare and contrast how you curse someone today versus how you curse someone in the ancient world wow that's that sounds like a lot of fun i'll be watching definitely and um yeah that, that you just heard it from there that's that's coming up that is something that's definitely worth checking out um and by the way before i close out i just want to let you know i really need to update this outro so if your name <laughs> if your if your name is supposed to be on this list and it's not i promise i'll do it by next time but pat thank you for your time and this has been great and you have just attained true gnosis you have just attained true gnosis the demiurge has no power over you.